Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming on your Sunday. My name is Cindy Strauss. I'm the Sarah and Bill Morgan Curator of Decorative Arts, Craft, and Design here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. I'm also your speaker for this afternoon and the curator of the exhibition Radical Italian Design 1965 to 85, the Dennis Friedman Collection. And I'm going to shamelessly plug our catalog, which is yeah, ooh and off, ah, yes, uh, which is really uh, fantastic and available in the bookstore. And if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, I hope that you will join us upstairs after the talk uh, to be able to experience it in person. Just one housekeeping item, please, if you wouldn't mind turning your cell phone to vibrate or off. I know your neighbors would appreciate it, as would I. Okay. So, we'll go ahead and get started. Join me. 1950s, 1960s Italy. La Dolce Vita. Italy's economic miracle coming out of the devastation of the post-World War II era, when there was incredibly rapid expansion of industry and also of the cities. And believe it or not, by the early 1960s, architecture was the most popular major at universities across Italy, showing you just how much a demand there was for people to address new ways of living and the burgeoning urban areas. If you were creating a new home or redoing an apartment in Italy and you wanted to be up to date in the 1950s and early 1960s, you might have furnishings such as these on the left hand side by Osvaldo Borsani, um, one of the great Italian architect and designers using wood in the same way that the Scandinavian designers were doing uh, to create this wall system. And on the right, the great Joe Ponte, also architect, editor of Domus Magazine, interior designer, here using his preferred palette of blues and creams and blacks and elemental, elemental geometric forms to create everything from furniture, to tile floors, to wall panels. As you moved into the early 60s, plastics start being introduced. And this is what's referred to as an era of bel disegno in terms of Italian design. And indeed, it becomes very prominent globally, and Italy continues on its primacy as the leading exponent of new design and new ideas. So here you see new forms, more minimal and elemental. These were portable. These were less expensive. They were made for a younger generation. So this is the environment that predates, immediately predates, and is existing as our protagonists come into the picture. This is a group photo of um, perhaps the most important radical designers and architects. This one is taken uh, about 1974, but um, you get the feeling it's a youth quake it's mostly male, and these gentlemen are emerging out of the universities and the architecture schools, particularly in Florence and Milan and Torino. Their ideologies were shaped by their research concerns that related to new modes of living and urban life. They were also tremendously interested in social issues that were facing people in these new cities, the environment, and a response to the growing consumerism that was surrounding Bell Design. So everything that you're going to see later on this afternoon through this talk is in reaction to these kinds 
of design objects. So if you keep them in the back of your mind, you will understand why what we're about to go into was so radical um, and such a, a concise break from the past. The radicals, as you can imagine from the name of their loose group, um, were political, but not political in an anti-government way. They were political in their protests against issues about consumerism and design. So here is the very famous 1968 Milan Triennale exhibition. For those of you who are not familiar with the Triennale, uh, not only is it a building that you see on the left-hand side, but every three years since the late 1920s, it has held the most important exhibition in Italy and one of the most important exhibitions worldwide of architecture and design. The very first day that the Triennale opened, students from Milan, from Florence, from other parts of Italy, um, overtook it and did a sit-in, if you will, to protest what they felt were the exhibition's consumerist tendencies. So they weren't joking around. And um, while I don't think anyone uh, actively supports graffiti, um, this was one way in which uh, they were able to express themselves as well as the actual physical uh, protests here, so much so that the Triennale closed that very day. It has never been seen. There are only a handful of images from the interior, but they basically shut down the Triennale in much the way that they often shut down the architecture schools in terms of protesting um, those places and the ideas. They were deeply concerned with public housing and housing for workers. And you can see two, um, I guess today we would call them zines, but they were um, small brochures that had manifesti and images in which um, here, this is by Grupo Strum out of Torino, how they're showing the protagonists. You have your capitalists, you have your slums where your workers are, you have your students who are protesting it. Um, I think you can see the labels here over um, many of the people, capitalist, uh, people who are in charge of housing. This was of particular interest in Torino where you have Fiat as the major uh, employer of the city. And so all of these kinds of issues are burgeoning, they're burbling up, they are really important to these young architects and designers, and they are mostly realized through ephemera, whether it's magazines like you see here that were self-published, uh, models, drawings, watercolors, collages, sometimes some unbuilt, unbuilt models. But what we have in our exhibition here, and we'll talk about this afternoon, are the objects that are the manifestation of this movement. In addition to the concerns that they were experiencing in their own daily life and the cities in Milan, they were deeply connected to the larger art movements that were taking place at the same time. Uh, for example, on the left-hand side, you see an image from the 1964 exhibition of American pop art at the Venice Biennale. Every single one of these architects and designers went to see that show and were deeply impacted by it. And then you have the galleries in Milan and galleries in Turin, to be specific, who are starting to show American pop art. On the right-hand side, a view of an exhibition of Arte Povera, the movement that grew at this time out of Torino in which humble materials are used to create sculptural works. Through their activities, through their cities, through the journals and magazines and conferences that they attended, they were well aware of the artists uh, who were working in these two movements. There's also a great influence of performance art, um, which was burgeoning in contemporary art at that time that impacted the radicals. But really, when we think about a movement per se, it starts in 1966 with the Super Architectura exhibition, and you're seeing an image of it here on the right-hand side and a poster for it on the left. 
It was scheduled to take place in November 1966 in Florence, one of the main cities where the radicals were working. But because of historic floods that took place in November, the city was brought to its knees. The exhibition space, of course, where they were supposed to hold it was no longer feasible. And so they found a very small gallery, a two-room gallery in Pistoia, Italy, which is outside of Florence, where they were able to hold it. It was called the Jolly Two Gallery, which is just a great name um, for an extremely subversive exhibition. You can see from the right-hand side, this exhibition was a total environment in which two collectives, Super Studio and Archizoom, combined together to show the manifestation of these theoretical and philosophical ideas about a new language of design, one that prioritized color, texture, pattern, envisioned new forms for living. Uh, you can see here this lounge chair, and pay attention to these shapes here, which are the cardboard prototypes for a lamp that we're gonna see in a moment. The show was incredibly popular and influential. Granted, within a small circle of Italian architectural students, others who were interested in the issues that they were writing about and they were facing, and most crucially, a man named Sergio Camilli, who was the owner of Poltranova, one of the manufacturers of modern furniture and lighting from that period, came to the exhibition with Ettore Sotsas, who was the creative design director of Poltranova. They met these young students who were all in their 20s. He loved what he saw, and he decided that he was going to help them disseminate their ideas by putting some of their objects into production. Here's Arkazoom, one of the few collectives, I should say, that had a, a woman who was part of it. It truly was, um, the radicals were largely a group of men. Um, they adopted the lightning bolt as their symbol, a symbol of new energy, a symbol of when a lightning bolt hits the ground, creates a solid combustible break. Um, collectives at this time functioned in a way that they didn't necessarily function the way we did today. So today, if we think of a collective, we think of everyone has an individual specialization, and then each the, an object or a design gets passed from one to another. To, and during this period, it was all about the total group coming together, working together to create a harmonious object or a harmonious project. And it was very much in the spirit of the times and uh, Florence in particular was known for its collectives. Here is an incredibly rare painted panel. Uh, you almost never see paintings. You see a lot of graphic design, but almost never paintings in this movement done by Archizoom. And this is the Poltranova showroom. You can see it hanging right back here on the back wall. Um, here are their lightning bolt symbols. You also see uh, the representation of a radio and antennas because the radicals saw their objects as vehicles for communicating their ideas. Everything that you see in the exhibition and we'll talk about today was functional, but function was not necessarily the first, second, or third um, reason behind the design. Two of Arkazoom's very early designs that were put into production by Poltranova were the Mies armchair and stool and the San Remo floor lamp. And this is an advertising image um, from the early catalog in which they were uh, pictured. The Mies chair and stool is the only one of the radical designs that has been in continuous production since it was first made in 1967. Um, for those of you who know Mies van der Rohe's furniture um, and you know the tenants of the Bauhaus, the radical movement was in opposition to the Bauhaus and the emphasis on function. And here they're kind of, this is not an homage 
to Mies and his tubular steel furniture, but rather part of their commentary that they are doing something completely different and are thinking about design in a different way. But they're using the steel. They're using, uh, there's a, this is actually a lit footstool. On our version, there's a horsehair pillow and a horsehair pillow here, sort of a nod against, or not against, but a nod to Le Corbusier's use of horsehair um, on the pillow and bolster for his 1929 famous chaise long. So that people would get the point, they actually named it Mies, so that you would automatically understand that this was um, an incursion against the Bauhaus. And seeing it upstairs in our Mies-designed pavilion um, really brings that point home. You also see with the San Remo lamp, um, they were very fond of taking symbols or recognizable objects and transforming them much in the way uh, that they saw with pop art. And you'll see with this and many of the other lighting designs in the exhibition, these are not lights to read by, but rather they provide atmospheric sculptural light in your environment. Here's Super Studio, the other collective that was a part of the Architectura exhibition and two of their lamps that were made. Um, this, if you look at the top here, you may remember the cardboard cutouts that were in the original image of uh, Super Arch Architectura. They were put into production by uh, Poltronova, and they were about this tall. So really the height of those um, cardboard cutouts. This example is one of three prototypes that were made for a floor lamp version that was never put into production because they couldn't quite get the angle right. But you'll see it upstairs and you'll see how the light emanates from inside. The same thing with their Gerpa lamp here, um, also made out of plastic, in this case acrylic, with a Bakelite handle that you can turn and these individual leaves can move and be rearranged so that you can have it all bundled vertically, you can have it sort of in midair or as we have it upstairs or you see here, um, more of a, a table lamp or a floor lamp version. And again, the light eminence emanates from inside, so it's very much of a light object even though it was billed as a functional lamp. Super Studio um, was also deeply influenced by minimalism and created a series of furniture as well as architectural projects that focused on the grid. What you're seeing on the right hand side is an image from their Istogrammi project. Um, where they are investigating the grid into all of its variations, not only for potential furniture design, but in this case for architecture. And what you see on the left-hand side is a prototype cube for the Missouri City series, which was the furniture uh, realization from the Istogrammi. So it's a very, very simple plywood box Plastic laminates, we're going to talk about that a lot uh, this afternoon. Laminates uh, be, having been created in particular by a company called Abet Laminati um, in the 1950s and were adopted by the radicals as a way of doing decoration um, without getting into something that was uh, difficult to control or hand painted or having to use other materials. So this truly is an incredibly elemental work. Part of Super Studio's um, vision for architecture in the world comes through the Continuous Monument Project, which comes directly after Istogrammi in about 1970. And you see how they're envisioning a version of utopia, an, a utopia where people can live and the grid is harmonious, the grid representing cities and architecture is harmonious with nature. Some of these objects were put into production. And I should pause to say that this is not a commercially successful movement. 
many, you know, to say the least, I mean, look, would you buy that furniture with her <laughs> gloomy face uh, not enjoying her photo shoot? Um, so this is, this is the production, the Quaderna um, furniture, which, so we have upstairs a table, this table, um, from this series, and then we have the prototype cube on view also. But these pieces, you know, indoors was melding with outdoors. It was an infinite idea of architecture. Um, this is not your hippie modernism, the uh, utopianism, excuse me, the way um, we experienced it in the 60s and early 70s in America. But it was a different kind of utopianism where um, it was all about ideas and the practicalities of it were not quite so successful. So you had stage sets like this, um, and it's interesting looking at the advertising to see how the designers wanted to express themselves. There weren't the kinds of communes and things that uh, we had more in the United States, but rather rigid, gridded, cubed furniture that you would, that's heavy and you would somehow lug um, outside into nature. There was also another collective that was really important in Florence, and you see the head of it here on the right-hand side, Lapo Benazzi, still the radical um, at 80 years old in this recent portrait. Um, his collective was called UFO, or UFO, to us, and you can see the kinds of projects that they staged. This is a happening in Florence, in which um, they created a series of inflatable uh, objects that were protesting consumerism and protesting um, ideas of commercialism as coming from the United States. He also created some objects. These are two lamps that are in the exhibition um, that are direct commentary on American capitalist and consumerism, ten consumerist tendencies as seen and promoted through Hollywood. So you have the MGM lamp with the symbol of MGM Studios, except your lamp where the lion should be, and Paramount here with the volcano. Um, these are all handmade, one of a kind, not one of a kind, sorry, handmade works. Um, they are, you could still order them today from Lapo Benazzi. Um, they probably, he probably over the period last 50 years might have made 20 of each, maybe 15 or 10. Um, there was no place to sell these works in Florence. And so he had them in his studio and if you happen to know him or you saw him or saw um, an exhibition with some of his pieces in it, you could order it from, that, from him. But there's a lot of uh, interesting dualities in terms of the radical designers, not just the use of industrial materials, but everything's made by hand, but also the anti-commercialism, anti-capitalist messaging, but yet they needed to make a living at the same time. So that's one thing also to kind of keep in the back of your, of your mind. Um, they tried to tow a very hard line and they did so in terms of their theories and ideas, but where it broke down was they did actually want these objects to get uh, out into the world so that their ideas and messages would go forth. There just weren't a lot of vehicles for that to happen at the time. You also see during this period a lot of customizable furnishings, especially for a new way of living. This is Gianni Petina, who you see up here on the right-hand side. This is the Rumble sofa. We have the model, the handmade model for it, uh, complete with his terry cloth towel that he used uh, to upholster it. And this was something that he originally designed for his architectural and artist studio in which he was having lots of people over, wanted to have an alternative experience for their seating. Um, he often repeated a mantra in which he said, design smaller scale was a daily exercise to practice the language of architecture. So while there are these designed objects that we have in the movement, they are truly linked to architecture and it's the architectural theories that are driving their forms. 
you know, how did people find out about the radical movement? Because you're talking about a relatively small group of people in Italy. Well, there were some very important journals, uh, including Casabella, which was edited at the time by Alessandro Mendini, Modo, edited by Mendini and Franco Raggi, In by the architect and writer Ugo La Pietra, and then the first PhD thesis on radical architecture by Paola Navone and Bruno Orlandoni, which was published as a supplement to Casabella. And so not only were progressive people who were in the know in Italy subscribing to these magazines, going to the symposia, going to the lectures, but they were also distributed internationally. And as Alessandro Mendini told me, well, we might have published 3,000 issues of Casabella, but some were reaching the architecture schools in America. They were reaching Germany. They were reaching France and Vienna. They were also reaching Great Britain through connections of like-minded progressive architects who began to invite many of these designers to speak in their countries or would come to Italy to see presentations. So if you were interested in these materials, you could learn about them, even though, depending on your country, you might not necessarily be able to see the objects in person. Milan was really the center for this intellectual activity and the promotion of it. So the magazines were all based there. Um, you also had Milan as the gathering point for a lot of the artists working in other media. And some of the leaders who were based in Milan were also designers as well as architects and theorists and editors themselves, including Alessandro Mendini whose Monumentino da Casa here from 1974, which he called an object of spirituality or spiritual use, one of four that was ever made, one of two and a half, as I like to call it, that survives. Because as you can see from the right-hand side, the original one was burned in a rock quarry outside of Milan for a cover shoot for Casabella magazine. So this is where you also get the connections to performance art and performative aspects. A second one was also burned, and there are a handful of chunks left of it uh, that are in a museum in Italy. There is the one here on view in the exhibition that is in Dennis Friedman's collection and then um, in a what can only be described as kind of a miraculous coincidence, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston has the fourth one. I should also say that Mendini envisioned this as something that would be used. And so imagine if this is in your living space and you're sitting in the chair on top, what a different view point you're going to have of your living experience, of the people interacting in your living experience. And that was a central idea behind it, as well as when he calls it an object um, for spiritual use, he's thinking about the ideas of, of monuments and the spirituality of monuments. He also designed this rather incredible spaziale chair, which the drawings were featured here uh, on the cover of Casabella. There were six chairs and one table made, never put into production. And one of the things that I love about this chair, and is a really nice connection with Houston too, is that the, f Ooh, my pointer's gone out, the feet, the shape of the feet are based on the shape of the lunar landing module uh, from NASA. And the image, the lacquered image on the seat, which you see here um, even better in a sort of um, drawing for it or an image for it, is a picture, a topographical picture of Earth as seen from the moon. Um, so connecting again to larger kind of cosmic and spiritual issues. Now in Torino, the third major city for the movement, um, you have a collective called Studio 65, which is emerging from the architecture school there. And Torino and Studio 65, deeply influenced by a kind of utopian pop art 
vision of life. And here's an advertisement that Studio 65 designed for many of the objects that they created. And so you can see this kind of fantastical um, scene with the clouds, the blue sky. It's very joyous and uplifting, all of these objects coming together. They collaborated quite closely with Gufram, which is the other manufacturer besides Poltronova who produced any of the objects uh, that went into production. And um, I would say that when I refer to them as manufacturers, we're not talking about assembly line manufacturing, but rather things that are molded but then hand carved, um, hand shaped, and they take a long time to be made. Again, part of the reason why um, they were not so avail widely available and not so uh, successful. Gufram's pieces tend to be, you know, the ones, the big showstoppers, uh, things like Pratone or Big Meadow, um, in which they were looking at a patch of grass and thinking, how does one bring nature inside or outside? How does one increase it and make it um, an object that communicates? And here you can see on the right-hand side one of the ways you can sit in it. You can also just kind of fall back and sit. Multiple people can sit in it at the same time to create a different kind of, not conversation pit, but conversation vehicle. Um, and the skin for it, this is molded polyurethane foam, which is a new material for the time. And the skin is called gooflock, um, which was invented by a young architect and designer named Piero Gilardi, who you'll see in a moment. Each pratone has up to 20 coats of gooflock on it, all hand painted, not dipped, but hand painted. What the goof lock did was it allowed the foam to remain um, firm. It allowed it to, to uh, have its integrity so that any kind of liquids couldn't uh, harm it. And it gives it what looks like sort of a rubberized skin. This chair, believe it or not, is incredibly comfortable. It's one of the few pieces I can tell you that I have sat in, not ours, but at the Gufram factory when I was doing uh, research, they invited me to sit in one. And it cushions you, it holds you firmly, it cushions you softly. You feel almost like you're sitting in a dense cloud. And it's really quite a wonderful thing. Um, here's another one of the early Studio 65 pieces, Capitello from 1970, also the molded polyurethane foam and goof lock. The image that you see on the right is one of the advertising images from the period. This creamy white is the color that this example originally was. It has darkened over time, um, which is what happens with light exposure um, and just general air um, with this kind of material. And I think it's the same way that silver oxidizes. It's the same kind of thing over a long period of time. And when we think about this chair being 50 years old, this is a great example, and you'll see some other pieces throughout the exhibition, where there is a nod towards classicism in terms of the forms. Here, this is more than a nod towards it. It's not funny, it's not witty, but rather what Studio 65 was doing was they were trying to, through this object, challenge the myths of classicism as the ultimate expression of taste. And I think we all um, know that classicism as a style is incredibly enduring, um, so much so that many of our, uh, even today, our bank buildings, our school buildings um, are done in the classicist, uh, classicist style. They also took on a lot of special commissions. This is an era when many of our architects and designers were uh, creating full environments for nightclubs and discos. They were also doing store environments or the newfangled gymnasiums um, for working out. We have a rare chair here, uh, one of eight that was done as the interior seating for a Torino boutique called Skin Up which was an accessories boutique, um, also shoes, and so you would um, sit in that environment. 
for many of these young architects and designers, these commissions were some of the early projects that kept their business going. It was how they were able to realize their ideas and support themselves. One of the projects I think that uh, Studio 65 did that speaks so clearly to their interest in social good and social causes um, is the Babylonia, which was designed originally for their young three-year-old daughter, the two principals, um, when they wanted to provide her with something that was safe larger than Legos or Lincoln Logs, where she could build and use her imagination indoor and outdoor. And so they consulted a child psychologist and spoke to him about colors, about shapes, about forms, and created this interactive building system that you can see on the right-hand side is completely customizable. Uh, you can take it outdoors, you can climb all over it, you're not going to hurt yourself. And this became an incredibly popular and important um, object for children's schools and libraries and is back in production today being used for many of the same reasons. I don't want you to think that radical design is all about furniture and is all about materials like foams. There is a major lighting story to be told through these designers and it parallels many of the same issues that we've talked about already with the furniture. To repeat, these are not lamps to read by, um, but rather they are light sculptures to help create um, an atmosphere. They're completely small batch made, so there were a lot of companies such as New Lamp Italia or Solca B that were only in existence for three or four years, each one of these lamps being made by hand. There is, on the left-hand side, everything from um, Fulvio Ferrari's amoeba lamp in the tradition of ready-mades, where this is the hubcap from a Volkswagen Beetle. It just has had a hole cut in the center where the emblem would have been, and a simple light bulb. In the center, the Angolo lamp, which becomes an extension of your interior architecture. As you'll see it upstairs, it's angled and leans against the wall. Um, to the right, you have Quanta by Gianfranco Fini, where you have simple tubes, plastic fluorescent tubes here with bulbs um, that create a light sculpture. There's also an incredible strain of furniture done by sculptors. I mentioned earlier how so many of these architects and designers were aligned with other artists, pop art, Arte Povera, they were part of the same community. There were some of the sculptors that were conscripted into the radical circles to create pieces of furniture. This um, is a little bit of an outlier for Radical. Um, it's Fabio de Sanctis's buffet. It is more nodding towards surrealism and in fact was exhibited and included in the last surrealism exhibition in 1964 and Andre Breton wrote very eloquently about it. Um, yes, these are car doors from the Fiat 600 series. Notice the feet here, a kind of witty play on the hairy paw carved feet that you would see in historical wood furniture. Um, the doors do open and it is a functional cabinet. This is one of three examples that were ever made, the only one with doors from the 600 series. The other two were made from the Fiat series with the 500 doors. But what pieces like that did was help to engage and to show sculptors that there was a place for them in the movement. So these are two pieces by Piero Gilardi, the inventor of the uh, gooflock coating uh, that I mentioned, was part of the Arte Povera movement, um, did incredible sculptural works in which he was bringing nature inside using these new polyurethane foam. So here you have a series of two foot by two foot 
tiles in which they could either be on the floor as a floor tile or you could hang them on your wall. And his Sasi, the rock here, which is a chair ottoman, came in three different sizes. And here's the advertisement on the left-hand side for the Sasi. And notice, here's the production Passiflora lamp here. But on the right-hand side, these are his nature carpets. So this is really from a one-off artistic sculptural perspective. This is the kind of work that Gilardi did that was shown at art galleries, um, not only throughout Europe, but also in the United States. There were other sculptors who became involved in the movement. Arano Palma here with this table sculpture, as he called it, featured on the cover of Domus magazine in 1971, uh, the year that it was made. This table is very humble materials, just simple wood, as would be um, part of the tenants of Arte Povera. And each one of those holes, those hundreds of holes that you see there, were partially drilled by Palma. And then he inserted woodworms into the holes, which then carved deeper channels into it. And all the time, he recorded the sound of those woodworms. So when he showed this single suite of furniture, and here's a detail of you can see um, the worms and how, what they've done in terms of the texture. When he showed the single suite of the furniture, he played the uh, recording of the woodworm. So again, you get that performative aspect. And here is the man himself. Um, I love these images because they really, they're, they're art directed by the designers and they just, they show you what, what they wanted you to see. So here is, uh, <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> so this armchair here is the one that's in our exhibition upstairs as well as the table. There's the other armchair and there's also a large settee um, as part of this suite of sculpture. There are also two other chairs in the exhibition uh, linked to Arte Povera with that use of humble materials, Ugo Morano's very elemental San Picasso chair on the left, and Ricardo Dalisi, who was another one of the radical architect, sculptors, um, performance artists, designers, who was based in Naples, so outside the three major center, main centers. Um, he worked in very impoverished communities, did a lot of projects with children, was a real proponent of social justice and working against inequality. Many of the projects he did, he would go into communities, have people, have children gather sticks, gather stones, gather trash, gather basic humble materials and have them create sculptures or functional forms. And here, this is one of two armchairs uh, that he made. It's the very same idea. Very rough hewn, simple elemental pieces of wood that he has painted. Dino Gavina, who was probably the third of the triumvirate of, of leaders of manufacturers, took a slightly different tact in terms of engaging people to create um, some limited production radical furniture. Um, through his firm, Simon International, he invited a number of artists to create pieces. So you have Man Ray here with this bench uh, that is upstairs. You have Merritt Oppenheim. You have um, the Ron Ron Poof um, by Marion Baruch, and here you can see how this thing actually works. Um, when you see it upstairs, it's three foot by three foot sphere. Um, so it's not quite clear, as with many of these objects, whether they are functional or not. And then you have Magritte's apple and hat here. So these works were also part of the radical movement, but directly engaging a different kind of artist and also marketed to people who were collecting their painting and sculpture rather than people who were necessarily uh, looking specifically at architecture. And then finally, um, one of my favorite projects from this era, uh, Ugo La Pietra, you see on the right hand sign, a bit of a Renaissance man. He was an architect, a sculptor, performance artist, editor, theorist, professor. 
In 1977, a lot of his works took place in Milan in the urban landscape. In 1977, he did a series of lamps. There were less than 20 that were made in two forms, the one you see here on the left in our exhibition and here with the angel wings called the Archangel Metropolitani lamps, in which he stole these stands out of the Milan subway. They were used to um, hold broadsides or advertising posters. He brought them back to his studio. He attached hand-painted plexiglass forms, electrified them here with the halo neon, uh, here with this kind of zigzag neon, and then he put them back into the subway and back into the streets of Milan and watched what happened, um, watched how people interacted with them. Uh, very few of them actually survive, um, as one can imagine. I'm sure that the city of Milan was none too happy to have their stands um, altered in such a way, but um, this is one of the surviving examples here, and it's just an incredible record of this important project. So where could you see these designs? In Milan, the Salone de Mobile, which was founded in 1961, was the place where you could see furniture in Italy every year. You could see everything from reproductions of historical objects to the bel disegno plastics that I was showing you uh, early to by the time you get to 1967 when design is invited into the Salone and international exhibitors are invited, you could see some radical design. So this is a trade show um, in which you have people coming from all over the world. It's meant to promote Italian design. Some of these works were shown in places like Harrods in London. There was a big exhibition in Paris um, at the Centre Pompidou. Um, these are going to be the pieces, and this table and chairs are upstairs in our exhibitions, that were put into small productions. In the United States, this man, Charles Stendig, who used to go to the Salone, could not believe what he saw with his eyes. He was mostly selling modern furniture for offices, for lobbies, for homes, that was more of, a, it was upholstered as well as not, but it was a more um, acceptable, not as challenging style. And he went, he met a lot of the radical manufacturers and designers, and he became the one who imported, there's our tablecloth, table there. He imported all the Studio 65 pieces. This is an ArchiZoom seating um, system. Watered down for the American market with just a solid color upholstery. ArchiZoom in envisioned it in a um, leopard print upholstery and it was actually called the Safari Sofa. But it was through Stendig and then through the major exhibition in 1972, Italy, the New Domestic Landscape, that people in America become aware of this movement. And I'm proud to say that our exhibition is the first show since the Domestic Landscape exhibition to look at this movement. Emilio Ambash was the young architect and curator of the show. It was split between two sections, objects and environments. It was one, imagine 1972, one of the most popular shows in the history of the Museum of Modern Art at that time. Over 230,000 visitors. It even beat out the sh recent show at that time of Gertrude Stein's family collection. And here's why. Um, the objects were installed in these incredible, specially designed pavilions in the garden of MoMA. Um, you saw things that you never envisioned before. In, and it was quite controversial. In fact, the eminent New York Times critic Ada Louise Huxtable said, quote, the show is supposed to be controversial, controversial because the designers represented are not in agreement that there is any point in designing beautiful objects. Again, you, we wonder why this was not commercially successful. Um, the 
we did have some radical objects in it. Out of the 180 objects that were included in the section, there were less than 20 that would be considered radical. Here you have the Archizoom pieces we've discussed, and you can see on the left-hand side that Poltronova was so proud of being in this exhibition that they took out full-page advertisements in leading journals to show the designs that they were highlighting. And if you look at the Mies chair there, you will, again, understand why Ada Louise Huxtable said in her review, a chair will never be a chair again. It is now an object whose formal characteristics are derived from or motivated by the semantic manipulation of established socio-cultural meanings, i.e., I don't get these chairs. <laughs> Here's the environment section where many of our radical designers and architects were um, exhibited. They created objects that did not have environments for the most part, um, but just you experienced um, their ideas. The following year, the Walker Art Center mounted this exhibition, Sotsas Super Studio Mindscapes, which was curated by the legendary design curator at the Walker, Mildred Friedman. It traveled, it was influenced by the MoMA show, it traveled to seven venues in, at universities that had architecture schools or small regional museums. Oops, sorry. Um, there were no objects, just drawings and collages that were conceptual. And I just want to quote to you two reviews because I just, I can only imagine what people thought of this when they saw it. One, one reviewer said, quote, it seems that the word architect must mean something different in Milan. <laughs> the other one quoted that he felt that architects had just completely gone berserk. <laughs> So that's the reception that this material was getting in the United States, which, which hopefully then um, will not surprise you that it just falls flat. By 1974, there is nothing happening with radical design, not only in the US, but throughout Europe, there's a, a, a fallow period, which comes to an end in the late 1970s with the development of another collective called Studio Alchemia, led by Alessandro Guerrero. It was established in 1976, and it was a different kind of collective in the respect that he called the leading practitioners of the movement and asked them to design objects or to contribute objects to a very important, what we now consider a very important exhibition called Bauhaus from 1979. Bauhaus, again, a play on the fact that this is the anti-Bauhaus movement. Alchemia was interested in creating a new language of design, one in which you can see here in this broadsheet rendering that served as the catalog for this show. Um, heavily colored, lots of geometric form, laminates, patterns, new functions for objects, and yes, a very healthy dose of postmodernism, which was a dominant style at this time. You'll see our friends, the MGM and Paramount lamp that were designed earlier and became part of this collaborative. Um, some of the other objects in the show, like the Svincolo lamp, we'll see in a moment. All of these pieces were handmade prototypes. Again, reviving the idea of communicating ideas through the objects. They hoped to sell some, but it was not the main uh, goal for it. And here are three pieces in the exhibition from that seminal uh, show, the Bauhaus show. Here you can see the use of laminates um, in terms of designed patterns. Uh, the table monument, which is just that, talk about challenging function. It's not a fruit bowl, it's just meant to sit there in all of its monument glory on your dining table. Um, our eight foot high Svincolo lamp with its neon light source on top and the Capadano here in which Sotsas is using marble 
um, and, oh, sorry, formica that looks like marble over um, an MDF to create this kind of uh, architectural monument. This um, collection was debuted at the Milan Salone, and then an enterprising, crazy man named Rick Friedman, who had a gallery in New York called Art and Industry, decided to bring it to New York. And you can see, here's the Proust chair. This is a Sotsas table, um, a lot of that collection. He didn't sell a piece. It um, kind of put him out of business. Uh, for a year or two afterwards until he regrouped. The motto of his store, or his gallery, I should say, was don't be afraid of the furniture. <laughs> you can live with this. Um, and here's the kind of advertisements that he set up. This is a bus station outside the gallery um, with various severe looking designers and this this is uh, the play on this is not your grandmother's furniture it is your grandmother's furniture uh, here and a couple of more pieces in the exhibition that really demonstrate these ideas so you have on the left hand side Mendini's chair table so that uh, back folds down it can be a table and you see the color palette you see the rhythm of geometric forms and shapes uh, that are here on it and on the right hand side Alessandro Mendini looking at the same historical armchair that Urano Palma was that that historical form. Uh, the original, the Proust armchair, also from 1978, was hand-painted canvas and more of a pointillist pattern. Here, he's playing with the idea of classicism in um, coloring it with, in a verdigris color so that it appears like it's bronze. Now, this movement, alchemia, is what comes before Memphis, which is a movement that most of you are probably more familiar with. It's the commercial side of these ideas. And here's a Tori Sotsas who broke away from Alchemia to start Memphis in 1981 and their initial collection. Um, the Alchemia works that we have upstairs and that are part of the radical movement are the conceptual um, objects rather than the commercial manifestations. But we do have two objects that dip into Memphis. There were a handful of architects who straddled both groups, including Marco Zanini and Andrea Bronzi. Here, um, the Bronzi bookcase is one of three. The Zanini um, is this incredible molded uh, fiberglass armchair with sparkly green color. Um, working through conceptual ideas, but having it made in something that could be reproduced much more easily. And this is where our show ends. It does not fully go into the Memphis movement. I want to end up by just telling you a little about, about the architectural environment that you're going to see upstairs. It is based on an unrealized model by Archizoom, uh, the collective out of Florence that we've been talking about, who did a major project uh, in 1969 called No Stop City that exists in drawings, in collages, in watercolors, and unrealized models in which they were interested in the idea of the infinite city, where there would be no boundaries to growth, where agrarian society could come into the city and urbanism could come out of the city, and it would work in a harmonious nature. For interiors, this is what they envisioned, and this is what we based our design on, and we had two terrific young architects from Almost Studio in Brooklyn, New York, who conceived of the design and worked with our exhibition designers. So this would be your infinite interior, and you can see the mirrored columns. It's based on a grid with open areas, and then you had mirrored uh, walls that would give you that sense of infinity. Know that these were done in sort of a two foot by two foot model. So what you are witnessing um, upstairs, and here's a plan for our model, um, is a full realization of it. And I leave you with one thought. Imagine our Mies van der Rohe Cullen and Hall building, international style, to its most incredible expression. Imagine Archizoom criticizing that idea with their no-stop city 
and imagine them, us building, the Museum of Fine Arts are building this pavilion to show these radical objects that were against the Bauhaus and international style in a uh, progressive and incursive um, and disruptive environment. So you have this wonderful opportunity that only we could have here at the MFAH. And so I'm so delighted that you're going to be able to experience the exhibition and these objects in this environment upstairs. And thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Thank you.